Thanks, Tia. Thanks, Alicia. Everybody, uh, as, as you heard, Ian Hockley, I'm the executive director and founder of Dylan's Wings of Change, and my colleague, Justin. Justin McLemory, I'm from Hartford, Connecticut. I'm a master trainer for the Wingman Project and also the chief locust focuser and founder of Focus Your Locust Team Building Training and Development. Nice to see you guys. So um, we had all our prepared content and some slideshows, and we're going to stick mostly to the track. But we just feel that what has happened really in the world this, well, these past few months with COVID and then the past week and everything around social justice needs, needs space in the room. So we're just pivoting a little so we can bring that into the discussion. But Justin's going to kick us off and get us going. Yeah, thank you, Ian. So. Um... Like Ian said, we had our plan, kindness and empathy is kind of what we do in our work and, and getting people to connect. Uh, and given all that has transpired over the past week uh, to not address and, and name the, uh, the upset, uh, the, 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 the extraordinary events that are taking place all over this country as a result of, of the murder of um, George Floyd, um, would be, would be remiss on our parts as educators, as humans in the world. Um, and so I do want to just take a moment to acknowledge that wherever you are, uh, wherever that sits with you, um, and to recognize that we are all in this together and that we all share responsibility in moving forward positive change. And we'll, we'll get more into that. Um, and sticking somewhat to our script with a twist, um, Part of what we do is, well, all of what we do is based in experiential education. And so that looks very different now through the screen, um, but we've shifted and, you know, as they say, shift happens. Um, so we're gonna shift today uh, and take an age old adventure ed activity that we've transformed to use online. Uh, huge believers in connection before content, okay? so. Um, if you don't have paper available, I'm gonna invite you while I'm giving this instructions to try to get three pieces of blank paper together and a, a, a marker of some sort that will show up when you hold your paper up to the screen. So it can be any color marker, maybe not yellow, cause that's hard to see, um, but any color marker that, that can work. Um, we're going to do three different drawings, okay? We're not gonna communicate with each other about what these drawings are. This is an based on an old adventure activity called Negotiation Square, or as it was also called, uh, Hey Baby, What's Your Sign? I think it was named in the 80s, like way before, uh, you know, when things were a little weirder um, and, and less uh, appropriate. Um, so I've, I've, I've flipped it now to say, uh, show me the sign, all right? So what I'd like you to do in the next, um, I'll wait for faces to pop back on because I, I think that must mean that people are away from their screens. So the goal here is going to be to, to imagine, if you will, the people who are shown up to this Zoom, the 47 participants who are sitting here sharing space and time with us on our screen this morning. We collectively have some kind of amazing awesomeness, right? I mean, just clearly because you're here, uh, I have an expectation that you're pretty awesome. So. I would like you to come up with a symbol, a sign, if you will, that you feel represents the collective awesomeness and power of this group of people right here in this, in this Zoom room today, okay? Take about 30 seconds to draw whatever that is. It's like Pictionary, you don't have to be a total artist, okay? Um, so you're drawing that symbol of, of whatever it is that you feel represents the collective awesomeness and power of this group of people joined with us here today to talk about kindness and empathy, social emotional learning. Okay. I'm gonna keep giving you the instructions while you draw. In a minute, not yet, but when I say go, I'm going to invite you to just keeping your mics muted, hold your symbol up so that everyone else can see it. Okay, and while you're doing that, we have multiple pages here of, of faces. Um, Take a look at what everyone else has drawn, all right? We won't communicate with each other, all right? So leave that chat box alone. Uh, no texting each other. Hey, you draw this, I'll draw that. Um, we'll, we'll scroll through and we're trying to come to a, a collective consciousness, a collective conscious consensus, if you will, okay? We will do two more versions of this drawing, okay? 
So take about another 10 seconds to wrap up your, your first drawing, your first symbol. The ultimate goal is for our third iteration of this drawing to be as close to similar as the others as is possible. Okay? All right. Anybody still need time? All right, okay, I got one hand. All right, good. Way to use the hand, because I wouldn't have heard you. You're muted. All right, taking about another five seconds. Perfection is highly overrated. All right, so if you're ready, I'm gonna invite you to make sure your camera is on, because I still see a few names and we won't get to see your picture if that's the case. And go ahead and hold up those images and let's take a quick look, see what we got. Awesome, those are beautiful. Okay, so, so, so some similarities already. All right, page two, I got a lot of, of just uh, non-cameras over here. So make sure your cameras are on or we won't get to see your pictures. All right, lots of hearts. Okay, good, a lot of love in the room. All right, let's give those people with, without their cameras on about another 15 seconds to click them on and hold up your sign so we can see. There you go, okay. Pie charts and hearts. And... All right. I'm gonna assume that these folks on page two who have no pictures are just listening in. Oh, here we go, all right. Oh, I can't see yours with the earth background. <laughs> yeah, the virtual background, I think, is, is making some people's pictures challenging to see. That's okay. All right. It's a basket. A basket. Okay, cool. Basket. Dig it. All right. So now that you've had an opportunity to see some of those, we're gonna redo the exact same activity, all right? So take another 30 seconds, new piece of paper, taking in what you took, right? What you've just gotten from other people, what you've seen, the commonalities, the differences. How can you shift yours to accommodate others and bring in what other people have so that we can ultimately land on the exact same place of being on the same page, if you will. Making sense? Next drawing, you got 30 seconds. Have at it. All right, taking about another 10 seconds to wrap it up. I know I'm blazing through this. People are like, no. Speed round. All right. And if you're just about there, I'll invite you to, on three, we're gonna hold up our next one. Take a quick look at the multiple screens. Ready? One, two, three. Go ahead and hold those up. Ooh, awesome. All right, we're starting to come together here. Okay, lots of similarity. I'm seeing a lot of hearts involved. Hands, hearts, empathy, circles, trees, the earth, people. All right, so definitely some commonality beginning to emerge. The sunshine, all right. Okay, let me look at this next page. Oh, good, more people are popping up in the next page too. All right, two people holding the heart together, people within the heart. Awesome, all right, so we're coming together. All right, a divided, I can't tell what that is. Um, very cool, okay. So as you can see, just from, just from noticing, right, just from having a, a quick notice and looking around and really seeing what other people are doing and taking a moment to take in what other people are, are creating and doing, 
helps us to get on the same page, helps us to see the commonality and to bring it in together. This is our final round, all right? Again, the goal is to get as close to the same as we can. We're not going for identical, we're just going for commonality and similarity, all right? Go for it, you have 30 seconds, you're on the clock. Have fun with it. All right, take about another five seconds to wrap that up. All right, markers down. That was the, that was the standardized test taking kid in me. All right, didn't you hate that? You knew, anybody here, were any of you guys here this kid? Done, yeah. <laughs> All right, anyway. I was once. Um, all right, let's see what you got. Show us your sign. Ooh, awesome. All right, okay, yes. Love it. Oh man, there's so much that's just merged and joined. Okay, cool, I'm flipping to the next page. Ooh, good, more people on the next page this time. All right. Some are very similar. Okay, we got some peace. Awesome. All right, beautiful. So again, this is the type of activity that you can do on Zoom. Uh, you can do it in person. You can put it, you can attach a theme to it. Um, the purpose here was really to um, model the whole idea of connection before content. Okay, I'm a huge believer in connection before content. When we do an in-person wingman group as young people, educators, whomever is in the training, enter a space, there's an activity before we even say a word. They come in, we, we, there's an activity, an entry activity, right? To get people connecting and get people reflecting about what are we about to get into? Um, which drives the second point that I kind of feel is really important for all groups environment dictates the outcomes, right? It dictates um, excellence and success, whatever you want, okay? And so in this case, the environment being the space that we're in and the space that we're sharing. So if we're, if we're creating our connection before content, we humanize the entire experience before it's already begun. This can feel still very disconnected. It's beautiful to see everyone's faces. We get to hear people's voices. Um, I'm so grateful that this whole COVID and Corona um, pandemic shut-in has happened in a day and age where we've had this ability to stay connected in this way. And so many really neat and, um, and beautiful connections have been made and, and remade um, because of the abilities of technology, but it does have its limitations, right? And so much, just like while we are in in-person groups, we need to make sure that we're paying careful attention to creating those con those connections way before we create that content so that people have that emotionally safe space to enter into, right? If we're, if we're humanizing each other, whether it's in person or on a screen, right, we're still together, um, we're going to be much more willing and feeling uh, uh, much more emotionally safe in order to create this, this space in where we can take some risks with one another whether it's in a conversation about current events, whether it's in academic, taking academic risks with one another. Um, the more that we humanize each other and connect and make the other people in the space feel valuable, the more we're going to be able to give and get from each other. So hopefully you had some fun with that. Copy and steal everything that you see here today. Um, this, Ian and I talked about, hey, what do you wanna lead off with? And we decided to go with something that actually I blogged about for the Boost Breakfast Club 
maybe a couple years ago, um, Ian and I had the opportunity through the Digital Citizenship Institute uh, to have a, a uh, to, to play in Zoom um, with people from around the country and, and in Mexico as well. Um, and we, we created this butterfly effect challenge and we opened with this activity not knowing how it would go. It was the first time we ever did it. And so we figured, hey, let's try it with, let's try it with Boost as well and knowing that it, it's a good one. Uh, so hopefully you thought so too. Run with it, twist it. That's what makes it your own. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Ian before you have to listen to me anymore. Thanks, Justin, appreciate it. So uh, we, we love that activity, great way to kick off. Um, if you're hearing an accent here, um, that's definitely, I'm, I'm a more recent immigrant to the United States. Um, and where I grew up, I grew up playing football. I know over here it's called soccer. Um, and we always talk about soccer as a game of two halves. Like the first half can be going great. You've scored some goals, everybody's celebrating. And at halftime you go in and something's gone wrong. And you come out, maybe someone's sent off, and the team starts arguing and it all falls apart. And you've got a choice to make. Are we going to pull our socks up? Are we going to turn this around? Are we giving up? And I feel like I've lived a life of two halves. The first half was wonderful. I grew up in England and married a wonderful woman. We had two fantastic boys, Jake and Dylan. And then we get to move to the United States. And it's a dream come true. Nicole was born in Rhode Island. And Jake's birthday is the 4th of July. And we moved to the beautiful town of Sandy Hook in Connecticut and settled down to start our new life. And then really that dark second half started on December 14th, 2012, when Dylan was one of the first grade victims in the shooting at Sandy Hook that took 21st graders and six educators. And I don't wanna dwell on that, but two things that really sparked the next stage in my journey. President Obama came and he hosted a vigil at the high school. And he stood up and he talked about the need for change. And I know he was very specifically focused on the problem of violence in our society and gun violence and school shootings. But I was hearing this word change and the change was needed. And that stuck with me. And I was actually very fortunate to spend some time with his spiritual advisor that came with him, Dr. Laura Asher. And we got into all sorts of discussions about so many things, so many that I can't remember. But she wanted to hear all about Dylan. And we shared stories about him and how he was developing and how autism was affecting him. That's one thing that made Dylan, Dylan. And we got onto talking about butterflies. I'll tell you at the end why. Uh, and Laura especially talked about butterflies and, and that symbol of change. Like we talk about the butterfly effect. A butterfly will flap its wings, such a small thing, but the ripples spread out and can cause a hurricane. And so with those things in mind and this message of change, we took the money that was being donated to us in Newtown. We created Dylan's Wings of Change, the wings of the butterfly and the change we wanted to create. And we started programming to help kids, help kids get a better start in life, get the things they needed. And as we're doing these programs and we're grinding money out, we're seeing this, the other epidemic, not this one we're in right now, but this epidemic of social isolation that our kids are descending into. The kids that are not finding their place, they don't feel welcome, they don't feel they have anyone to turn to. And this isolation is causing them, it's killing people. They're hurting themselves, they're hurting each other, they're growing up and they're killing themselves, they're killing other people. But this root cause of social isolation and how, we can, how can we get back and start to address that? And realizing that the antidote is there, but it's not an easy antidote, and it's empathy. Right? Empathy, empathy, that wonderful emotion, that if we can foster it in someone, gives them the ability to connect with someone else. But the realizing that empathy is the end of, if it's the end of a journey, if it's the top of a mountain, it starts at the bottom with kindness and respect. And, and gratitude. And, and that's why, you know, if we think about why do we focus on these first with our very youngest? Because those are the building blocks. And as, as we can develop those and help our children learn them, we can start to elevate them and, and teach them about courage as a response to fear and to overcome their fear and their resilience and their perseverance. And it builds through hope and compassion and we get empathy. But that you don't teach it. 
you, you don't teach empathy. There's no lesson to sit down and, and, and learn empathy. You have to foster it and nurture it and, and help the kids and the adults find it in themselves by giving them an experience that that aha moment that they learn they realize that they've connected with someone else or how someone else has helped them or how they've been able to help someone else so our program wingman came out of that and as justin mentioned we're steeped in experiential learning everything in it is activity based all the participants are engaged physically they're moving around that challenge mentally to engage and solve problems together and their emotions are stirred and through focused reflection at the end everybody everybody really gets to come together and, and understand how they were impacted by what they just did or how other people felt it's so much about feelings we started the program here in connecticut that's where we're based it's grown slowly but purposefully and and it's not just a school program uh, because we've realized kids, humans are everywhere. Social and emotional learning needs to be everywhere. So we have the program for schools where it's very often led by the students, but we have it in after school programs. We have it in sports and recreation. We've adapted it so it, it can be run anywhere because my word, we need this everywhere right now. And just to close out and be ready to hand back to Justin, you know, when COVID hit, we pivoted to online and we're retooling the whole program so that we can continue this most essential thing. If you're an educator and you're working with kids right now, you know how much they're hurting and they're, they're struggling in this time. And that will continue as we move into this, whatever that new normal is. So that's our program and just that's where we come to you from, but with the ultimate goal to put more empathy in the world. And we, we genuinely believe that if we can get more empathy out there, it's going to be a heck of a different world when we come out of this. Thank you for hearing just a little piece of my story and where we come from, Justin. Um, yeah, so I'm, I was struck when I met Ian, right, to hear that he had come around to this uh, way of, of addressing something that was so close to him. And I... Uh, I've already shared this with Ian over beers. Um, how just constantly struck I am, and and uh, what an incredible mirror uh, he is for me as a as a person, as a father, as an educator, um, to be able to emerge from such an awful thing as having your child murdered, and and not only want to impact change, but in the way that he has, right, walking back into schools, um, and not with any agenda of politics or of gun control, uh, which would be the obvious, uh, but of empathy, right? That's the sole agenda of this program is, is helping people to connect. Um, and it's magic, it really is. And people act as though like we're, we're, we're doing something that's very formulaic and very like, you know, every SEL has been something that people in experiential education have been doing since Adventure education was was born. Many teachers have done it for so long without it being called that. And now all of a sudden, social emotional learning is this buzzword in education. Um, and gratefully, on, on for those of us who've been doing it for a while, because we were now it's not a hard sell. It, it was that touchy feely thing for so long that people are like, "Yeah, I don't need that. They're, they'll be fine." Grit, you know. And um, it, so anyway we've come back around to this place. The pendulum has swung back where we're saying, all right, we need to be human with each other because just being data heads is not working. Um, so the first thing I wanna say about SEL work is it is not rocket science. When in doubt, give them your heart, right? We all have this thing in us and, and we, we're all connected. Our brain and our hearts are, are connected. And when we remember that, um, when in doubt, give them your heart. We are going to connect just by nature of the fact that we've, we're, we're reconnecting to our own human self. The other thing, and I've kind of, I foreshadowed a little bit with uh, dropping the whole, don't be perfectionist piece into the, the uh, instructions of show me your sign. Um, there's no such thing as perfect, right? And so don't be afraid to teach SEL work. 
it, there doesn't need to be a perfect way. We just need to go for the perfect try. Taking that a step further, um, you know, there are these five overarching core competencies of social emotional learning from KSL, right? Uh, Self-awareness, so understanding your emotions and thoughts and how they influence your behavior, self-management, how we carry ourselves in the world, what we, you know, how we are, uh, responsible decision-making, social awareness, relationship skills are kind of their top five. Um, I really feel strongly, especially, I mean, I've always felt this way, but it, what's going on in our country right now really highlights the need for this. Um, I really feel strongly that in concert with social emotional learning also needs to be some cultural humility practice right? Which goes hand in hand with the, the concept of we don't need to be perfect. We just need to go for the perfect try. So those for whom cultural humility may be a newer term, um, you may have heard things like cultural competency trainings and things like that. I don't believe there's such a thing. Like how can you be culturally competent in everyone else's culture? You just can't, right? And I, I, can, be, I can be immersed in, in my own culture and I can be immersed in the people around me's cultures but there's no way that I can fully experience and feel what other people are going through and their life experience because of the skin they're in, uh, the upbringing, you know, preference, identity, et cetera, right? Like I am me, you are you, we are we, and we are all together. Um, and so cultural hu humility really speaks to the fact that no one really needs to be an expert in anything other than being an expert and being with other people. Right. And knowing that I don't need to know everything about everybody else. I just need to know that have some humility in, in the fact that I can be with you. I can I can share this space and time with you. I can empathize with you and I don't need to to be an expert in that. That doesn't absolve me of my responsibility to learn as much as I can about other people's cultures and not put the burden on uh on people who are experiencing oppression, right? To teach me, that's, there's Google, it's great, right? Um, but I think it's an important thing to consider as we talk about social emotional learning work is cultural humility. Um, and it gets down, I think at the foundational level of that term is that other word empathy, right? It, it kind of goes hand in hand, okay? So as, as you find yourselves, feeling certain kind of ways about the things that are going on, um, both in terms of, you know, the, the two types of protests that we've seen in, in my city over the last two weeks, right? So two weeks ago, we had people protesting um, because they wanted everything to open up. And, uh, and, and now we have people protesting because we don't want people being murdered because of the color of their skin. Um, I think it's important that we, we recognize that people all come from different angles on things and, and we need to listen to one another. Doesn't mean we need to agree, right? But we do need to listen. And when we do it from a place of empathy and when we do it from a place of humility, we're gonna be able to learn a lot more and, and hopefully share a lot more so that we have a deeper understanding of each other. One of the greatest ways that I personally have, have grown my circle and i'm really fortunate to have grown up in a place uh where it is super diverse um and where you know more people don't look like me um and so i've, I've been around a lot of difference my entire life um but i think it's very important that we get to spend time hearing where other people are coming from and what other people's experiences are um, I just kind of went off my course for a second, but I also want to make sure that I say this thought because I think it's a really important one that all of you as out of school time educators should consider and push for um, before I forget, because this came to me this morning. Um, as things open back up, wherever you are, right? And it's going to look different everywhere because that's how we roll. Um, I think out of school time education is going to be the key in reopening schools. I think that we may see a huge push and, and if we're not yet, I think that we can help push that wave um, toward more funding for out of school time education. School buildings and class sizes are not set up for social distancing. They're gonna need to be doing hybrid style learning and maybe shifting um, of, of 
who's in school when and out of school time educators we we have an opportunity here to really provide that alternate space right and if schools are already going to have to be squeezed down to a smaller size that means they're squeezing time down we can really be the drivers of social emotional learning in out of school time and maybe out of school time is not necessarily before and after school now it just might be concurrent with school depending on where you are and so it, that's just a little thought seed that I had. If, if uh, you want to see it germinate, like here's a clone, pick it out of my head, you know, put it in some soil, fertilize and, and give it sunlight and, and let's see it grow. I'm happy to bounce more ideas at another point. Um, but we've both talked a lot already. Um, I'm a huge believer in, in doing things and we're already over half, halfway through the show. Um, so one of the things I also know about this new world of sitting in front of a screen and seeing all these faces is, um, for one thing, our bodies aren't really designed to sit as much as we probably have been lately. Zoom requires a huge amount of attention and takes a, a, a whole different type of attention than sitting in a room with people where you can read the energy, you can feel the vibes. Um, I have to look much more deeply to, to see people's faces and a lot more faces at once to hear things differently and our attention spans are not what we think they are. So I, I want to invite you in a minute, not yet, but when I say go, um, Alicia, you can get ready. Um, I'm going to invite you to leave your screen for a moment. Okay. And when you do, I want you to go find two artifacts. They don't need to be perfect, right? So if, if you're, in your office, you may have some sort of artifact. If you're in your home, you likely have many artifacts. But I want you to choose two artifacts, okay? One of those artifacts is going to represent your personal awesomeness, your power, your, your, the magic that you may have already knew was, was within you before we shut in and, and had all this time with ourselves to kind of check in with ourselves. Or you may have relearned about in this time something about your awesomeness that you've rediscovered that you are planning to that you will commit to bring forward into this new way that we're going to reemerge. okay whatever that looks like i don't want to call it new normal because I, I hate that like there was too much that was normalized that returning to a normal just doesn't make sense um so your superpower right what are you awesome at what's your awesomeness that you're bringing back into your practice that you've relearned or rediscovered in this time. That's one artifact. The second artifact I want you to bring back will represent um, what you see being your greatest challenge personally, your personal greatest challenge, both in this time and as you re-enter your work, um, community, in this new time that we're in right now. Aside from coronavirus, our world, our, our country looks very different right now. Um, and in many ways, very much the same. It feels like uh, I wasn't there then. I mean, I got some gray, but I'm not that old yet. Um, feels like it could be another long, hot summer like 1967 right now. And so I think we're at a critical moment in time. Um, so what do you perceive being your biggest challenge that has been your biggest challenge and may, or may be your biggest challenge as you reemerge into this new space and time? Everybody picking up what I'm putting down? Feeling where I'm going with this? All right. So take about a minute to do that. When we come back, seeing some thumbs up on the screen. I don't even know how to do that. That's cool. Um, when you come back, um, Alicia is going to sort you into breakout rooms. It looks like we have about 57 people here, and that probably includes us too. Uh, so let's, let's get people into groups of five. Okay. Okay. And so when you come back, um, you may already be in a group of five. We are close on time. So, you know, no dissertations or, or you know, like, like I'm doing right now. Um, just give each other enough time to share. And I'll, I'll let you each individual group decide which one you want to go with first. Okay. If there is time coming back, uh, we'll, we'll give you about, because I know you can put a time limit on the groups, right? So let's say two minutes, let's say 10 minutes. Okay. In a breakout room. Okay. Is that enough time or is that too much time, people? What do you think? That gives everyone two minutes. Good. All right. So take a minute, go find your artifacts, 
when you come back, you may be in a Zoom room and uh, we'll see you in a little bit. All right, well, as people are coming back from the from the breakout rooms, it's uh, it's awesome when people come back. Like the, the screen that I had before is totally different. I have a whole new set of faces here now, so it's awesome to see different people. Hello. Um, how did that go for folks? Does anybody want to um, share out your experience? I can't see necessarily long pages, so I'll, I'll invite you if you're if you're willing to share out how it went in your I room. I saw Etta raise her hands. Um, it was super enlightening, and just being connected this way through Zoom and just modern technology. Um, I was born in the '50s, so I'm a '50s kid. And growing up, we didn't have, you know, a lot of the things that they have now and that my grandchildren have now. So this Zoom is fabulous because we, I'm connecting with my mom and dad who were elderly. My dad's 90 and my mom's 85 in a care home. So we're able to visually and um, verbally be able to connect with them. So that's super important. So I'm, I'm learning humility and empathy every day. Cool. Which is great. The ladies were enlightening. It was wonderful. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Anyone else? Quick, quick recap of your experience in the in the breakout room. No. I'll say in our room, I think we noticed we all had a lot in common that even though we all pick different stuff and technically different quality, that we all were uh, feeling very similar things. Can anybody else relate to that? Does that resonate with others who were not in, in Sarah's breakout room? The commonality in both in both superpower and challenge? Did anybody have a superpower that was also their challenge? Yeah? What was it, Tia? <laughs> um, I, I talked about resiliency because I've always thought of myself as being pretty resilient, but I have uh, been challenged a bit in the past couple months with that. Yeah, this is this has been a serious challenge for for people. You know, like we're we're wired to be with other people. That's we're you know we're not that far out of our out of our primal wiring, right? Where we are wired to be with people, right? There's a beautiful concept um, out of South Africa from the Bantu language called Ubuntu. Uh, which basically speaks to the essence of what it means to be human, that we are inextricably woven together in this fabric of humanity, right? That I am because you are. And when we're all of a sudden, everybody go inside and stay inside and don't talk to people, right? Like it gets really weird. And, you know, so I've been forced to think about that quite a bit um, in, in multiple ways. I, I shared with the people in my little breakout room, I'd, I not only had to shut in because of like stay at home, I had to shut in because I had COVID uh, and was down for the count for a solid 18 days and, and then beyond. Um, but it really causes time to reflect and to recognize how much you miss people, right? So I know that we're, we're rapidly running out of time. And so I, I want to turn it back over to Ian in one second, but I want to leave you with this thought and something that I've really been thinking about through this time, especially when I was by myself like uh, away from my family in my house i I, have, I live with other people here and and i was by myself for that time um i've connected with with my my high school friends and, and my friends from around the country from wh who i grew up with from around the country and it took a pandemic to do it you know and and we have this technology and we're learning about it and those of us who are really good at it help others get get good at it because we will still need to use it even when we get to walk back into spaces together. We are all connected as humans together. And the more connected we, we stay um, and the more that we can both acknowledge our difference and recognize those similarities within the difference, the more that we're in listen to people's stories, right? Really hearing people's personal stories is, is how we humanize the other right? And it's how we get to be truly empathetic with one another. I'm going to end with a, a line that my grandmother taught me. You got two ears and one mouth for a reason. You're supposed to listen twice as much as you speak. And with that, <laughs> I'm going to zip my lip. 
thank you guys for putting up with this guy. I will love to see you in October uh, at Boost. Uh, I will be there if it still goes. I'm fingers crossed. And uh, though everyone in my breakout room knows all about Boost, but hasn't been yet, so go. It is awesome. It's the best conference out there. All right, Mr. Hawk. Thank Hawkins. you, Justin. Thank, thank you all. You. Justin. Thank you. And there's a reason Justin is one of our master trainers. He just gets this stuff. He's, he's lived his life this way. Um, and capture a PC said there about the real essence of any social emotional program you bring in. There are so many to choose from, um, or even when you create yourself, have it be about, or find one about genuine human interaction. Don't go for one that prescribes. Now we're going to talk about respect or kindness. That's not natural. You know, in Wingman, it's about just genuine situations where you never really know what will happen in one of our activities. But whatever emerges is genuine and real, and we help the kids, participants, because we do it with adults, you just help them talk out what happened, right? Mm -hmm. Kids learn respect by interacting with each other and realizing their similarities, their differences, and celebrating it and helping each other not by just sitting down and talking about what does respect mean. They feel it. So find programs out there that really help kids feel things and then help them understand what they're feeling. I said at the start, I'd tell you why this is a butterfly. So Dylan, one of his challenges was his speech and his comprehension. And autism was affecting him. And so he spoke in his own way and Nicole and I could understand him but he wasn't always able to express himself or follow complicated instructions. But at his essence, he was just pure love. And he liked to flap. When he got excited, he would jump up and down, he'd flap his hands. And one day, him and Jake, they're playing Mario Kart on the Wii. And, and Jake would always win because he's two years older, he's been playing longer. But Dylan had been practicing and practicing and he won. And he mm. jumped up and down and he was flapping because he beat <laughs> Jake at Mario Kart. And Nicole said, Dylan, why do you flap? Now, she wasn't sure if he understood the question or if he understood himself in that way. <laughs> and he looked at her and he said, Mommy, I'm a beautiful butterfly. And wherever that came from, and that resonated with that story that Laura <laughs> told us about the butterfly effect. And, and, and even more, and I'll leave you with this one thing because I've only just learned this. I listened to a podcast about liminal states and I'm going to screw up the definition, but a liminal state is that period of intense transition. The butterfly and the chrysalis is a perfect example. The caterpillar goes into this liminal state and completely transforms. And then it emerges at the end, something completely different. And we all have been maybe in our own way, depending on where we live in our cocoon, in our isolation, we're going to come out different. But scientists have studied that moment when a butterfly is ready to emerge and it has to break out and go through this painful process. And so they've experimented just letting it out, just unzip it and let it go. And more often than not, the butterfly will die because that is part of the process. In fact, it's the most painful and hardest process that coming out of this state. So think of we're all in that right now, and maybe this week even more but we're maybe at the hardest moment. And therefore that means the magic is happening and we have to endure that pain and help others and then move through it to this new state, whatever it is we're going to be in. I'll leave you with that. I thank Tia and Alicia and my wingman, Justin, and all of you and for everything you do. Thank you so much and peace. Thank you, Ian. I don't know if you know this, Ian, but um, several years ago at the Boost Conference, we uh, had a butterfly release in honor of Dylan and all other students that have been affected by uh, mass shootings. So um, I, I knew the butterfly story and we actually got um, caterpillars donated um, from a, a program called Insect Lore and we had several uh, programs throughout Southern California where the kids grew them into butterflies and we timed it and they were ready to fly away at the boost conference and we let mm -hmm. hundreds of butterflies go. So Dylan is always in our hearts and I want to thank you for sharing and for being here today. And Justin, um, 
I, I didn't mention this earlier when I introduced you, but um, I think I was about 19 years old driving down the streets of Hartford and I met Justin. Um, so it's been over 30 years and he's like family to me. Um, so I miss you. I miss Hartford. Thank you for being here. Appreciate you both. Same. Much love, everyone. Thank you so much for including us.